sickening victory already. Harry Gibbs completing a formality of a count. A done comes up, but it's too late. And he's got up only to fall again. He's so stunned. It's been a great fight. At times of magnificent quality. Other times a door struggle. A magnificent battle. And Conti of Britain is coming out on top. I see men at the moment of their greatest triumph. Sometimes a young man with the world at his feet who somehow misses the right path. It's Conte, world light heavyweight champion at 23. A wonderful win for Conte. In just under 19 months, this young man has taken all the major championships that were open to him. The British, the Commonwealth, and the European titles. And now, the World Light Heavyweight Championship. I see nights when men claim their victory and carry the crowd with them, so that nothing matters but waving the flag and rejoicing. All these fights came about because one man made them happen. He's been making fights happen for 60 years and more. He says he's 39. Boxing's a hard game, we all know that. Everyone in it's hard. Promoters are hard men. You know what would happen if they weren't? They'd wind up in the poorhouse. Harry will never be in the poorhouse. He's got a few bob, but nobody handed it to him. Fight promoters, well, they scream and yell till they get the right man at the right price. Harry was born in Stepney, a Jewish boy in the East End of London. Born back in the last century, though he won't thank me for saying so. Life wasn't easy, but the family weren't poor. His father was a master craftsman, and as a kid, Harry could box a bit. I can remember very far back, in the days when I belonged, I was on the cricket and football team of Old Montague Street School, and we had to play cricket and football in Victoria Park. And then some of the rowdies in Bethnal Green would be waiting for us. And that bred a feeling that we had to fight back. So I became a member of the Brady Street Club. The manager was Lord Nathan. And the two sports that I liked was boxing. I won the six stone 10 competition and uh, running. I'll always remember, I won the 6 down 10 competition and I got a medal worth about two bob. And I came home, my nose broken, still broken, and my father had ideas of me to be trained as a doctor or a lawyer. And he looked at me and said, what's happened? I said, Daddy, I'm the champion. And he had a big cabinet maker's hand, he was a master cabinet maker. And he slapped me, and the champion burst into tears. The next morning, my late mother took me to London Hospital, 
And they said, Mrs. Levine, when the swelling goes down, we'll operate. When the swelling went down, no operation. That's why I've had this lovely busted nose. Six stone ten, Championship. Six stone ten. How old were you then? Twelve. Can you remember further back than that, but before you even started at school, can you remember the, when you were a very young child and, and the home and your parents? Oh, we always had a very lovely home because my father was a master cabinet maker. Everything was made by hand. Every bit of furniture, no machine at all. He'd ask his figure, take it or leave. He was a very independent man. My father was born in Russia where he and his brothers were terribly persecuted. So the only way he could get out, and this applied to all the Jewish people, they changed their names. And three brothers, including my father, came to England. And it was very, very hard going. But he was a great cabinet maker, so he started making a good living. And became a naturalized British subject. And so much so, in the Boer War, he fought for Britain and was wounded came back and uh, couldn't work for a long time. And my mother had to go out and sell whatever she could to keep the us going. What about your mother? Did she, was she born in this country or no, was she again? My mother was born in uh, Prussia. And she came to England when she was five or six and went to Old Castle Street School in the East End. She never liked boxing, but she said, if it's a means of making a living and you like it, go ahead. You see, the, the East End in these days, and we're talking now, I suppose, what, the early days of this century, yeah. um, was full of Jewish people who'd yeah. come from abroad. That's right. And a lot of them went into boxing. Now, why do you think that was? There was a lot of persecution. In those days, it was very difficult for an elderly Jewish man with a beard to walk down Cambridge Road, because he'd be set upon. And this got the youngsters going, uh, the young Jewish boys going. And they belonged to clubs. They needed money, and they went in and they became professionals. And at one time, out of eight professional championships, six were held by Jews. So you're saying that the, the old uh, days when, when Jewish boxers were, were really a, a great force in this country was entirely due to the fact that Jewish people uh, were persecuted. Were persecuted yeah. in London. Yes. Really. Of course, all that is gone. Mm. Even in your family, um, boxing wasn't entirely looked upon with favour, was it? You're right. No favour at all. Didn't you have an uncle who was a rabbi? Yes. My father's brother, my uncle, lived in the West End. Made a bare living. He uh, used to say the prayers you know, for the congregation, had very little money. And I think in 1923, when I brought over Augie Ratner from New York to fight Ted Kid Lewis, in those days I had a car. I haven't got a car these days, not because I can't afford one, I don't want a car. And uh, Ratner trained, uh, excuse me, <coughs> at the Whitehall Motor Club, Hampton Court. And I took my mother, my father, and my uncle, the rabbi. And he met Augie Ratner, who was very polite, and he said, what a fine young man. Until Ratner had the strip to go in the ring and train. And there, of course, he set about the sparring partners, who were paid to be sparring partners. And then the the row began, he said to my father, his brother, you ought to be ashamed of yourself that your son is connected with this business where people hit each other for money. Terrible. And they had a row and my uncle walked out and found his own way home, Hampton Court. I heard about it and I went to see my uncle the next day or the day after. He was a very religious man. I said, Uncle, I'm sorry you said this, but... and I gave him ten pounds. And he then said, you know, you're a very fine young man. I liked him. He needed the ten pounds. <laughs> boxing wasn't so bad after no. all. <laughs> but my father never went to boxing. What do you think, if your 
parents could be alive today, what do you think they would say about your success as a boxing manager and promoter? Would they like it? Yes. Yes. Uh, well, I'm, I've minded my own business. I don't run around. Whatever I have, I own. And uh, I know a lot of nice people. What more? He knew the famous Lord Lonsdale. Here's our noble lord up on the ring at the old National Sporting Club in Covent Garden. Back before the First World War, the club and Lord Lonsdale were the governors of boxing in Britain. Harry can remember those days. He did a bit of fight reporting on the evening news. And before that, he worked as an office boy to George Lansbury, the old Labour leader. And then one day, Harry upped and went to America. Harry was already managing fighters in his teens, but he went to America to work on a New York newspaper in the circulation department. Harry obviously wasn't your average shy, retiring teenager. You know how I went over? I have no idea. I signed on as a, stu as a, a, a steward. I was no good. So I, they put me in the stokehold, shoveling coal, four hours on and eight hours off. The greatest man I ever met, Damon Runyon, took a liking to me and he used to go out every night with another great journalist, Walter Winchell. And Winchell used to say, Harry, speak in Cockney language, because I was trying to speak like a New Yorker. He said, you're a Londoner, you're a Cockney, speak like... <laughs> and I did. When I was on the... New York Daily News. I was asked, Harry, you're making a good living? I said, yes. Then why don't you become an American citizen? Okay. But I knew if you take out your first papers, you're not an American. If you take out your second papers, then you are. So I took out my first papers. I never took out my second paper, so I remained an Englishman. Why didn't you take out your second paper? I didn't want to. I loved England, always did. I go to America a lot, I go to South Africa every year, but I'm born here, I'm raised here, I'm very grateful. Who was the first fighter that you ever took charge of? Danny Frush. Danny Frush. Of Allgate. His real name was Danny Thrush. But in Spitalfields they couldn't say Thrush, they say Danny Frush. <laughs> Tell me about him. Well, he lived in the East End, and I lived in the East End. And uh, I met him one day. I said, you know, Danny, you're not being properly managed. So I said, what do you suggest? So then he brought his father along. He said, look, I like you. But he said, the only way you can manage my son, if he gets over a certain amount, I forget now what it was, you'll get your percentage. If you can't get over a certain amount, I want it in writing, you get nothing. So I had to go out and work. And he became the most colourful fighter ever. He didn't take you out in one punch. There was one fighter in France that knocked out every Englishman, Eugene Cricky. And Frush knocked him dead in five rounds. He was a wonderful puncher wonderful fighter but was he nervous before a fight he'd come back I've hurt my left hand don't need a left hand your right hand and so forth and so I had to kid him each round but when he let them go they went you see could anybody in those days could anybody become a manager I mean uh, today, if you wanted to be a boxing manager, now you've got to go to the Board of Control, you've got to persuade people that you're good enough to have a licence, you've got to buy your licence. Now you're talking about days when it was all freewheeling, wasn't it? You that's could, right. You could do what you liked. That, that's quite right. But just tell me, I mean, uh, what made you think you could be a manager? I wanted to be one. I felt I could uh, do it some good. I'd do myself good. Now when you first had a fighter, Danny Frush, yeah. your first attempt as a manager. Uh, what sort of money are we talking about that you, you got for Danny Frush? How much would he have got for an ordinary fight? 15, 20 pounds. 
But of course, that was worth a bit more in those days. Oh, a lot more. A lot more. I know there were tiny halls like the Manor Place, places like that. But there were only two halls, really, that one could do business. One was with the Premier Land in Backchurch Lane, and one was at the Ring, Blackfriars. Well, the fellow, there were two fellows who ran the Premier Land, Manny Littlestone, who was a relation by marriage of Ted Kid Lewis, and Victor Berliner, a very nice fellow. And I had ideas of what my fighters were worth, and I'd go in there, of course it was a double act. What do you want, Harry? And Harry said what he wanted. And Berliner, no, uh, Littlestone would go off like a madman. And then when I shot my, uh, told them what I thought, Victor Berliner would say, Harry, you mustn't take any notice and gave me all this soft talk. But we got along eventually. Whenever I had a fighter from the East End go to the ring, we'd have about three or four hundred supporters going there. And, I'll always, and the same when they came over to Premier Land. I'll always remember when Frush knocked out Curly, one of those fellows. It was a riot. But they all gathered around me. I didn't even go in the office and get my money. I waited for a week. But when I look back now, they were very, very, very tough days for everyone concerned in boxing. Augie Ratner, a good welterweight from New York, pushed Harry into the big time. Harry brought him to London in 1923, and Ratner beat the great Ted Kid Lewis. The way Harry got that fight is worth hearing. One thing I learned, never pass by anyone that wants to talk to you. I had an appointment with Major Arnold Wilson, who then was the only really, really big promoter uh, in London, he had the Albert Hall. There was no Wembley in those days. And walking to this court off Charing Cross Road with Ratner, I met a press photographer. Hello, Harry, hello. He said, I know where you're going. He said, where? Go see Major Wilson. I said, yes. He said, I've taken a picture of Lewis signing up to fight Ratner. Oh, that made me. I said, Augie, We've got the fight. I went up there and Major Wilson, who was a protege of C.B. Cochran, the big theatrical man. He said, uh, Harry, if you're looking for big money, my advice to you is to go back to America. So that's the way you feel, okay. 